Uh, good afternoon and good evening uh, to everyone. It's a great pleasure for me to be the chair of this uh, session uh, on the lungs in immunocompromised patients. I'm uh, Elias Ray from Paris. Uh, I'm working in St. Louis Hospital and I'm the coordinator of the program on immunocompromised patients in Paris. Uh, so we are at session seven. There is a slight change in the program as a uh, Professor Pastores from New York uh, will be the first speaker on lung cancer at the ICU. Professor Pastores uh, is uh, the director of uh, the fellowship program and uh, the critical care department at uh, Memorial Sloan Kettering in New York. Um, he has a huge expertise in the management of critically ill patients with cancer and hematological malignancies. Uh, and uh, it's a great pleasure to listen to you, Steve, so please go on. Thank you, Lee, and to the organizers for uh, uh, this wonderful event today. Um, as Ellie pointed out, I'm in New York City at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center, and I'm here to briefly discuss the challenges and some of the opportunities of treating lung cancer patients admitted to the intensive care unit. We all know that globally, lung cancer is still the most commonly diagnosed malignancy. It remains the leading cause of death from cancer among males worldwide, as well as among females in more developed countries. The highest incidence rates of lung cancer among men are in Europe, in Eastern Asia, and Northern America. More than 50% of lung cancer deaths each year are now in low and middle income countries. In the United States, uh, the rates and trends of lung cancer vary greatly. Highest rates of lung cancer in the United States are among males, among African Americans, people of lower socioeconomic status, and in the Mid-South. Much of these differences are related historically to smoking patterns. We know about 80% of lung cancer deaths are due to smoking. In the United States, uh, the rates of lung cancer are rare before the age of 30. They tend to peak uh, in the elderly population and then sort of plateau and start falling after the age of 80. Unfortunately, Less than 20% of lung cancer patients remain alive after five years. If you look at the data of lung cancer patients who are admitted to the ICU and you look at some of the larger series, lung cancer accounts for about 8% of all admissions of patients with cancer. Approximately a third of all patients with solid cancer who are admitted to the ICU are going to have lung cancer. Looking at a large SEER Medicare registry database in the United States, it's been estimated that one in four, about 25% of patients who are elderly with lung cancer will die after admission to the ICU. So if you follow these patients who do survive the ICU admission, 65% of those patients with lung cancer will die in six months after that ICU admission. Okay. If we look at some of the trends in ICU admission of patients with lung cancer, the most common causes of ICU admission for these patients are respiratory failure and sepsis. There are less cases of congestive heart failure and coronary artery disease as a reason for ICU admission in these patients as compared to 10 or 20 years ago. The intensive care unit is used in lung cancer patients mainly for those who are relatively younger in age, those who have significant comorbid diseases, and those who do not have remote or distant metastases. In a series by Cook published in CHEST in 2014, they found using again the large SEER Medicare registry, they found that older patients with lung cancer who are less likely to benefit from ICU admission tend to be admitted more commonly 
to intermediate care units. At Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center, over the last six years, we track the number of patients in our ICU who were admitted with lung cancer. There are about 300 patients over the six year period. The vast majority had advanced stage non-small cell lung cancer, similar to other series, respiratory failure and sepsis due to pneumonia were the most common reasons for ICU admission. About 10% of these patients had a do not resuscitate order for cardiac arrest on ICU admission, this percentage rose to 42% during their ICU stay. About 8% of these patients received chemo or more commonly immunotherapy during their stay in the ICU. Looking at the number of days that they stayed in the ICU, it was about 18 days. They stayed in the hospital an additional 13 days after ICU admission, so their length of stay in the hospital was rather prolonged in many of these patients. About 30% of them died in the ICU and about 42% total in the hospital. Of those who survived and left the ICU, the six-month mortality was almost 80%, and at one year, only 15% of these patients were alive. If you look at the aggressiveness of ICU care among patients with, with lung cancer, Cook showed in that study published in CHESS, looking at over 175,000 patients, about a third of whom had at least one day in the ICU, the number of ICU admissions of these patients rose about 40%. As I mentioned earlier, most of the patients that were admitted with lung cancer to the ICU were actually admitted more commonly to intermediate care or progressive care or step-down ICUs, as we call them here in the United States. But this data shows that we continue to have many patients with lung cancer who are still getting admitted to either a step-down or to a, a full-level ICU, meaning that we continue to be aggressively providing ICU care for many of these patients. We have had indeed many advances in supportive care in the ICU, from diagnostic modalities to um, uh, figure out the causes of infection or non-infectious causes of respiratory failure, diagnostic bronchoscopy in selected patients. Uh, we are using more protocols, echocardiography, guidelines, renal replacement. Uh, we have non-invasive tools such as CPAP, BiPAP, high-flow oxygen therapy to try to avoid invasive mechanical ventilation. And we're not sedating these patients anymore like we used to, and we're mobilizing them quicker from the ICU so that they can get off the ventilator. At the end of the day, many of the patients, however, who do require invasive mechanical ventilation as their initial strategy for respiratory support continue to have a worse outcome. Lung cancer patients who have airway involvement by tumor and those with recurrence or progression of disease or very poor performance status continue to have high mortality rates. But cancer immunotherapy has arrived and in the last 10 to 10 to 15 years, we are seeing more and more patients with lung cancer who are being admitted to the ICU following receipt or administration of immunotherapy. They are no longer receiving the traditional cytotoxic chemotherapy that was more common, and it's still common in many places. But cancer immunotherapy has arrived. There are now several agents that are FDA approved in the United States for many patients who have uh, certain receptor mutations such as EGFR, such as ALK and ROS1. So there are now targeted therapies, immunotherapies that are now able to help these patients that we did not have 15, 20 years ago. So many more patients with lung cancer that are coming into our ICU are now coming and receiving immunotherapy either before the ICU admission or during their ICU stay. More recently published in the fall, I think the very encouraging results from the PEMBRO trial 
comparing it against chemotherapy for those with PD-1 L1 positive non-small lung cancer, suggesting not only a significant increase in progression-free survival, but less adverse effects with pembrolizumab gives us hope that many of these lung cancer patients, at least with certain mutations, will be able to receive some of these more advanced and novel immunotherapy agents. But at the end of the day, we still have to know how to select our patients properly for the ICU. Many patients might have very advanced lung cancer and clearly with very little hope of recovery and improvement despite our interventions. And for many of those patients, palliative care probably is the better approach. However, for those patients with lung cancer, even with advanced disease who have the option of getting immunotherapy and have an acute reversible or potentially reversible condition, these patients deserve a trial of the ICU and in fact may need to be admitted earlier. And even if you're doing a time-limited trial, there are certainly categories of patients that clearly may still benefit and we should not give up on these patients compared to many 10 or 15 years ago. Recognize that early palliative care can be very helpful, not only in prolonging some of the lives of these patients when you compare them to very aggressive care, but also improving the quality of life of these patients with terminal disease. And this was shown very nicely by Tamel in his New England Journal publication in 2010, where patients receiving early palliative care received not only less aggressive care, but actually survived by about three months longer as compared to the patients that got standard oncologic care. The American Society of Clinical Oncology recognizes this and in their most recent recommendations from early this year, strongly advise that inpatients and outpatients with advanced cancer, including lung cancer, should get dedicated palliative care services early in their course and even concurrent with active treatment. So in summary, immunotherapy with checkpoint inhibitors will continue to replace standard chemotherapy for select patients with lung cancer and will transform their prognosis and survival. It is crucial that close collaboration between the intensivist and the oncologist will be required to define better the prognosis of these patients. Early palliative care is very helpful in reducing ICU use, but we need more studies and interventions to improve this end-of-life care and use our ICU and palliative care resources a lot more effectively. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Pastores. Um, I think that this, have been, this has been a very a good presentation and a very clear summary of the most recent part of the literature. As I know that you have to leave, I would like just to ask you two questions before moving to the next presentation. The first question is whether you think that there are patients that you admit to the ICU today that were not admitted in the ICUs over the last 20 years. And my second question is, this treatment that you referred to, and you very nicely pointed out that they were bringing a high rate of toxicity. Do you think that these treatments are going to warrant ICU admission for these patients with uncertain outcomes? Yes, yeah, so with regards to the first question, um, I, I think there are certainly uh, patients now that uh, perhaps maybe 15, 20 years ago, we would not be routinely admitting uh, but in discussing with our oncology colleagues, uh, uh, particularly for those select patients who may have the select mutations and can be offered some of these newer immunotherapy agents, uh, we do now uh, uh, admit them to the ICU if we feel uh, they are either at high risk for an adverse reaction from a novel therapy or if they have something that may be potentially reversible. So I think when I looked at our own series in the last six years, the patients that were admitted after 2011, 2012 were more likely to be receiving immunotherapy as compared to years before. And for some of these patients, uh, we, if they have something reversible, uh, we, we do take them uh, to the ICU. But again, it has to be a case-by-case -case, uh, uh, discussion. And your second question, uh, Ellie, pertained to 
my second question was about what you are, your expectations about the number of patients who will need ICU support for toxicity of these drugs where we, were, we will not be um, able to really predict outcomes in these patients? Yes, I, I could see certainly, uh, I mean, so far there hasn't been a lot of drug-induced pneumonitis in these patients, and when they do get septic, they do seem to be septic from either pneumonia or some of the other more common reasons because of their immune-suppressed states. So I think it's going to be a combination where we're going to see adverse reactions from time to time. Uh, but I think in the more common scenario, they will probably be getting admitted because they have, from their immune suppressed state, uh, more likely a complication related to either sepsis or some other uncommon infection like an opportunistic infection. So, but I think the paradigm is now shifting a bit. So I think we, we will be expecting for some of these patients that we might have an increase in admission uh, for these patients that are getting immunotherapy as, the, you know, as a potential option for their treatment of lung cancer. Thank you very much, Steve. Uh, I have a, a very good uh, uh, feeling about your presentation, and I, I really believe that uh, in the next years, uh, what you just pointed out, like uh, the thing that there are new treatment options, uh, new toxicities, uh, and new outcome predictors makes that we are going to have new patients with very different approach uh, when they are becoming critically ill. Yes. So have a safe flight. I know that you are leaving. And thank you so much for being part of the World Day of the Critical Lung. And uh, we are now going to move to the next presentation. And it's my great pleasure to um, invite uh, Professor Miguel Ferrer from Spain. He is the official representative of the Spanish Society of Pneumology and Thoracic Surgery, the CPAR. And everyone knows Miguel Ferrer for many reasons. One of those is about the topic he's going to lecture about, about non-invasive ventilation in immunocompromised patients, when, how, and what to expect. Um, thank you very much, Miguel. In patients, selected patients with with mild to moderate acute respiratory failure is uh, indicated or is supported by the, by the, the evidence, but uh, these patients need a very strict monitoring in the ICU and the prompt availability of endotracheal intubation because we have also extensive evidence on the uh, deleterious uh, consequences of the unnecessary delaying intubation when they fail uh, non-invasive ventilation treatment. We know also from one study that uh, early CPAP <coughs> is also a practical, simple, and inexpensive method to prevent deterioration of the respiratory function and complications in other selected uh, populations of uh, immunosuppressed uh, patients. And, uh, however, and there's a large uh, recent trial that suggests no benefit of non-invasive ventilation in either the main outcomes that are intubation or survival in this population. A very recent uh, guidelines uh, conducted by the European Respiratory Society and the American Thoracic Society on the use of non-invasive ventilation for acute respiratory failure addressed in one of its uh, questions the use of non-invasive ventilation in immunosuppressed patients. And here I show you what are the uh, forest plots for the main outcomes that were studied in these uh, guidelines. Regarding intubation, you can see three randomized clinical trials in the literature that used non-invasive ventilation and one using CPAP compared to standard medical treatment. And you can see that the poor uh, results show that non-invasive ventilation resulted in about 26% uh, decrease the risk of intubation when using uh, non-invasive ventilation. In this study, there were also a non-significant uh, trend to improve outcomes and overall, the uh, uh, likelihood to uh, need intubation with the use of both uh, non-invasive ventilation or uh, CPAP was uh, 0 0.71. Quite similar results were observed when mortality was the outcome. You can see also a decreased mortality with both non-invasive ventilation and CPAP, and the whole uh, results also showed a 32% decrease in the risk of mortality and also in the incidence of nosocomial pneumonia. Here, only three studies addressed this issue, but you can see 
also that by decreasing the need of uh, intubation and invasive mechanical ventilation, non-invasive ventilation was effective in decreasing the rate of these complications. And certainly, these guidelines um, showed or recommended the use of non-invasive ventilation in this indication with moderate certainty of evidence, and this was a conditional recommendation. I would like to sh show some particular data from these studies because uh, there are two relatively old studies and two relatively new studies that have substantial different uh, features. The first study, this French uh, study conducted in uh, 52 patients with different uh, diseases that uh, caused uh, immunosuppression, uh, they compared non invasive ventilation with uh, oxygen therapy. We can see that using non invasive ventilation resulted in a faster improvement of arterial oxygenation and also a decrease in the intubation rate and hospital mortality. And here you can see in this black horizontal bar that uh, the control group had a very poor outcome in terms of intubation and mortality. And uh, despite the fact that the outcomes were not particularly favorable with the use of non-invasive ventilation, this was really a, a marked decrease in these, uh, in these outcomes. Uh, quite similar results were observed in this uh, other study. This was a, a, they studied the different population patients who had undergone a solid organ transplant, either from the lung, liver, or renal. The incidence of acute respiratory failure in the postoperative period was 21%, and they randomized 20 patients in each group uh, to receive non invasive ventilation or standard medical treatment. And similarly to the previous study, patients in the control group had a very high intubation rate that decreased dramatically with the use of non invasive ventilation, and similarly, a clear decrease in the ICU mortality. This study also uh, showed the faster improvement of hypoxemia, less severe complications. However, when uh, looking at hospital mortality, this was unchanged with the use of non invasive ventilation. The third published trial was this one in patients with hematologic malignancy. The main difference with the others is that uh, the, the authors used early CPAP in patients who developed acute respiratory failure with the aim of preventing evolution to acute lung injury. You can see that in this case, the intubation rate in the control group was substantially lower compared to the two previous all studies, probably reflecting or a different population or advances in the care of these patients as it was pointed out in the previous presentation. But this intubation rate clearly decreased with the use of CPAP. You can see here in terms of, of absolute rates or in terms of this time uh, evolution, you can see that the quite lower uh, incidence of patients who needed uh, also uh, ICU admission and a dramatic improvement in the hospital mortality compared to those who were treated with standard medical treatment. Overall, this was a small study with 20 patients in each group. And finally, and probably the most extensive and valuable study, this was this multi randomized trial, very recent, published two years ago, in uh, different immunocompromised patients. These authors found, uh, in line with the previous study, a relatively lower rate of intubation and mortality in the control group without any significant improvement in both outcomes with the use of non-invasive ventilation. You can see this again in terms of rate and in terms of time uh, to uh, achieve this uh, outcome during the 28 days following randomization. Similarly, the survival uh, rate during these uh, 28 days was absolutely similar in both groups, and even the authors performed a, a subgroup analysis uh, according to predefined subgroups. And you can see also that this this uh, this lack of benefits was observed in any of the subgroup analysis that were performed in these patients. Well, let's to point out some considerations regarding this study because, as the authors uh, recognized in the discussion. This was a potentially underpowered study because there was a lower than expected mortality rate in the control group. And indeed, these patients at randomization had a median, median respiratory rate of 25 breaths per minute, which is obviously abnormal, but not particularly severe. 
and the median so far score of uh, five points. A second issue is that even they um, raise the question of a potentially injurious ventilation in the non-invasive ventilation group because the mean tidal volume was near close to nine ml per kilo of ideal body weight, which is higher than that recommended for these patients with uh, hypoxemic respiratory failure with a low median level of PIP uh, used. Finally, uh, the, the authors also um, treated patients with non-invasive ventilation for a relatively short time period. You can see that uh, during the three initial days, the median overall time these patients uh, remained with non-invasive ventilation was 13 hours, and there was a higher proportion of the use of high-flow nasal oxygen therapy in the control group in these patients. And this is important because high-flow nasal oxygen therapy is a, a very uh, promising uh, support technique in these patients. Uh, and I will show, uh, show you the main results with using this technique. Probably many of you know the Florali study. It was a multi-center randomized clinical trial on the use of high-flow oxygen, uh, nasal oxygen therapy in patients with acute hypoxemic respiratory failure, of whom 73% had pneumonia as the cause of the, the episode, and they compared uh, this technique with standard oxygen and non-invasive ventilation. Here you can see the main outcomes of this study. This is the cumulated cumulative incidence of intubation that was lower, was not significantly different between the three groups. And uh, however, the 90 day survival was significantly better in those patients who received high flow oxygen as compared with both standard oxygen or non-invasive ventilation. These authors also reported a subgroup analysis in the most severely hypoxemic patients, those who had a PaO2 to FiO2 ratio below 200 millimeters mercury, and they found that in this subpopulation, high flow nasal oxygen therapy uh, resulted in a significantly lower accumulated incidence of intubation. A subgroup analysis of this trial conducted specifically in 82 immunocompromised patients from this trial, they uh, also analyzed the results in these studies. Uh, overall, 30 patients received, uh, immunocompromised patients received standard oxygen, 26 high flow oxygen, and 26 uh, non invasive ventilation alternated with high flow. And the main results of the study is that the use of non invasive ventilation resulted in a significantly higher risk of intubation and a lower 90 days survival compared with the other uh, two uh, treatments. Again, I would like to point out some considerations regarding the Florali study, both the overall study in the New England, but also in the subgroup analysis. Non-invasive ventilation in the, uh, patients receive pressure support adjusted for an expired tidal volume of 7 to 10 ml per kilo of uh, predicted body weight, which is again higher than that recommended in these patients. And uh, actually, the mean pressure support level was 8 centimeters water. And we know from uh, previous physiological studies that this is a, an issue insufficient uh, level of pressure support ventilation so as to achieve a good decrease in the work of breathing and uh, to relieve dyspnea in these patients. Again, the initial peak was very variable, ranging from 2 to 10 centimeters water. So it seems that it was not particularly standardized. But uh, another issue is that the minimally required duration of non-invasive ventilation for uh, the, uh, the first two days was eight hours per day minimal. However, the actual delivery that was reported in the study was a median period of eight hours per day. It means that at, uh, at least half of these patients received eight or less hours a day of non-invasive ventilation and this is probably difficult to mm, assess whether a treatment uh, provided for such a lo uh, short period of time could be effective in these patients. And again, that how flow oxygen therapy was used between non invasive ventilation seasons. And there was also frequent crossover between groups, for example, patients with standard oxygen received rescue therapy in 20% uh, of the cases, and also those with high flow oxygen therapy. And finally, I would like to point out 
that uh, the, the Berlin definition of ARVS recommended the use of non-invasive ventilation in those cases with uh, lower severity of hypoxemia, those now considered as uh, mild ARVS. However, ARVS patients have been traditionally poor responders to non-invasive ventilation. And uh, last year, we had a very interesting randomized clinical trial that assessed the use of non-invasive ventilation, but using the helmet as the interface uh, different to the majority of these trials that used a face mask, mask as, the, uh, as the interface. These authors found a significantly better survival in these patients with the use of a helmet non-invasive ventilation as compared to face mask. And uh, this raises again a uh, 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 new question is to whether uh, what is the best interface for non-invasive ventilation in hypoxemic acute respiratory failure, which is mask or the helmet. So finally, and my conclusions are that uh, non-invasive ventilation appears to improve the outcomes of immunosuppressed patients with acute respiratory failure when compared to standard oxygen therapy. But uh, it, this is probably in the studies that have mm. used this technique for a sufficient period of time during the initial phase of treatment. However, the balance between an adequate ventilatory support and the avoidance of the potentially injurious ventilation is difficult to achieve in this population. And uh, the question is whether helmet and non-invasive ventilation could improve the outcomes in this population. And finally, that probably high flow nasal oxygen therapy could be a better non-invasive strategy for these patients. And possibly, the, uh, if we can alternate this technique with non-invasive ventilation, we could achieve the highest uh, efficacy. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Ferrer, for this very thorough this very detailed and very thorough literature review. We have time uh, to discuss one or two points uh, as we are uh, very good into the, the time scale. I would like to ask you whether you think that uh, the results uh, of uh, non-invasive ventilation that were demonstrated 20 years ago can be considered as outdated because at that time 80% of the patients were dying. And I believe that um, there are these data, these data showing the harm effect of prolonged NIV. And um, is it time now to reconcile all the findings? Uh, my personal belief is that um, NIV could be considered as a very good treatment option in these patients when they are hypercapnic or with a congestive pulmonary edema. But when they are into hypoxemic acute respiratory failure, and as you can see from all the studies that you showed, that mortality is only 30%, why do you think that we should continue doing NIV where mortality is so low, even when they are intubated? I think uh, I completely agree with you. I think the, the studies uh, conducted by around the uh, year 2000 are updated because now uh, all the support uh, in these patients has really improved. You have seen that uh, the two, um, we can call this the two recent studies and even the Florali study has shown quite as a lower rates of intubation. And um, the, uh, in the recent uh, trials, the efficacy of non-invasive ventilation is really questioned, is not so effective. And um, my opinion is that um, High flow oxygen therapy will be uh, now is or uh, now is the first line uh, support for acute respiratory failure. However, uh, given the poor outcome of uh, uh, associated with the delay in intubation, we have to select very well these patients, uh, patients with mainly uh, acute respiratory failure as the predominant uh, organ system failure, and to um, be very careful when there, there are other features, such as, for example, hemodynamic instability, renal failure, etc. If we uh, select these patients mainly with uh, acute respiratory failure, I think that now the first option in, the, in them could be half-low oxygen therapy. But also my experience is that alternating both techniques, you achieve the best results. However, this is experience, opinion, and is not obviously based on, uh, on, on evidence. Yeah, I agree with you, and I think that uh, what you just say is much more balanced than the recent recommendations with which I completely disagree. Because I believe that currently, acute hypoxemic respiratory failure 
should not be considered any more different in immunocompromised patients as compared to other patients. And the recommendations are based on evidence, but the evidence, evidence is still very debatable. I would like to discuss with you another alternative because you are the pulmonary person uh, about immunocompromised patients. Um, and you know, my question is quite tricky. Do you think that we should continue trying to make our best to avoid intubation in these patients? Or do you think that you should, we should put all our energy to identify the acute respiratory failure etiology, including sometimes intubating the patients uh, to perform what we consider is the best diagnostic strategy? Uh, sure. Uh, respiratory failure is only part of the acute uh, process in these patients. If we don't uh, have the possibility to treat the, the 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 cause of the of the episode, we will uh, also uh, we will only do a prolongation of survival of these patients. But actually, we will not achieve our goal, is that which is that the patients uh, can overcome the episode, surviving and with the minimal sequelae. Uh, regarding um, early intubation. Uh, we have to balance the potential benefits of an early diagnosis. It's clear that patients with acute respiratory failure conducting a, a prone alveolar lysis is very dangerous, and we have to uh, maybe uh, to use uh, or to conduct this in a very controlled uh, environment. But um, the risks of uh, unnecessarily intubating these patients should also be balanced. What is the, the per perfect balance? I think we can uh, not generalize this, and we have to uh, to individualize these patients. Sometimes we can um, re uh, reasonably uh, uh, know what is the reason of, of this uh, acute respiratory failure episode, and in this case, I think we have to push with uh, non-invasive support techniques in addition to uh, treating the episode. But when these patients do not respond during the initial times, or we don't know exactly what's the cause of the episode, uh, we have what I think is there is a consensus that we have uh, to avoid uh, unnecessary, an unnecessary delaying of intubation and there to, conduct, to intubate them and to conduct an aggressive uh, diagnostic approach uh, with endoscopic techniques, uh, etc. Thank you very much. I think that this is exactly what was uh, demonstrated in the recent uh, published study from Ephraim. This study is published in uh, October in Intensive Care Medicine, and it shows that there is a benefit from uh, high flow oxygen to reduce intubation, but there is no effect on mortality because these patients are often with the need of more chemotherapy, more disease control, and uh, when we don't have the ability to identify acute respiratory failure etiology, this is associated with more intubation and more mortality mm -hmm which is exactly in line with what you just said. Thank you so sure. much, Miguel. And, Thank uh, you very much. And I think that uh, this uh, uh, contribution is uh, really great. Uh, we are now going to move to the next presentation um, with Professor Gustavo Matutbello with the new advances in uh, lung transplantation. Um, and uh, I'm sure that everyone knows uh, Professor Gustavo Matutbello, who is uh, now working um, in, uh, um, uh, who is the, the past president of the Sociedad Argentina de Infectología, and who is very well known about his work on um, the lung involvement immunocompromised patients. And um, thank you very much. Um, uh, thanks. Um, well, uh, can you hear me? Yeah, we're, we're very well. All right, so what do I do now? Uh, how do I put my presentation up here? Um, so you go, you go to Inicio Rápido. On the screen, it's the upper panel on your left. Then you have the arrow. Yeah, that's fine. That you have the arrow. That's good. All right. Are you, uh, can you see there? Um, yes. The yes. Perfectly. All right. Well, thank you very much. Uh, thanks for everybody for being here, and thank also to the organizers for inviting me to participate in this uh, talk today. Uh, so I was asked uh, to discuss advances in lung transplant therapy, and I was trying to uh, think, well, how can I have a, a talk that will be of interest to a very, very diverse audience? 
Um, this is the audience as of November 2017. You can see that many of you are actually in countries that have very sophisticated lung transplant programs. Others are in countries that are less familiar with lung transplantation, but may see these patients in their units. Uh, so I was struggling to decide uh, how can I say something that will be of interest to everybody. And uh, what I decided then uh, is to actually talk a little bit about the current status of lung transplantation. And to do that, I thought that it might be of interest to show the summary of the 2017 report of the ISHLT registry. The ISHLT is the International Society of Heart Lung Transplantation. And they have a registry from essentially lung transplant from the entire world. Uh, and since the onset of this uh, procedure, and they publish a report every year, and the current one was just published. So I think this data may be of interest to everybody, regardless of whether you are at a center that has a lot of lung transplants, or you are at a place uh, where that procedure is, uh, is, is less often um, performed. So I'm gonna start by uh, talking a little bit first about how many lung transplants are, are being done these days, and what are the main indications? Um, so uh, here is a registry, and if you look down here uh, at this uh, number, uh, that's the total number of lung transplants performed since the establishment of the registry until 2016. You can see that this number is about 62,000. If you look at how many are being done per year, so the other number here, is almost about 4,000 transplants per year worldwide. Uh, now, the 4,000 transplants are currently being done in about 152 centers around the world. Where around the world are these transplants being done? Well, uh, here we have the number of transplants, um, and this column here is adult <laughs> lung transplants between uh, 2004 and 2016, and you can see that 55% were done in North America, 37% uh, were done in Europe, and 8% were done in the rest uh, of the world. Uh, now, as far as uh, what type of transplants are being performed, this graph shows in the vertical axis, again, number of transplants and in the horizontal axis the year. And uh, most of them, uh, were bilateral lung transplants, uh, while a minority were single lung transplants. And there's a reason for that, uh, and I will discuss it a little bit later. Uh, now, why are they being done? This is exactly the same data, but organized by indication. And uh, idiopathic interstitial pneumonitis, uh, mostly idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis or IPF, are about 35% of the transplants, while COPD accounts to about 30% of the transplants, and cystic fibrosis for 50%. And the rest is other diseases. So essentially IPF and COPD are driving the transplant process. Um, now, what are the outcomes? And here where the ICU comes in a little bit. Well, uh, here is the survival, you know, percent survival since 1990 uh, the present, and you can see two different lines. The top line is median survival for bilateral lung transplantation, and that's 7.4 years. The bottom line is for single lung transplant, it's 4.6 years. That's a major reason for favoring bilateral lung transplants, although there are a number of other reasons. Uh, now, uh, this is survival from the transplant, uh, you know, to death. Uh, but um, a lot of patients uh, will have a negative outcome during the first year, especially early, uh, due to uh, uh, things related to surgery or acute rejection. So we want to know also how many patients survive, what is the median survival beyond the first year. Um, by the way, this difference is different. Um, and that's called conditional survival. And you can see that for double lung, you survive the first year, your median survival is actually 9.9 .9 years. Uh, and uh, for single lung is 6.4. So reasonably good survival, but um, 
Uh, it's getting much better, but there's a still a big difference favored by lateral lung transplants. Um, now, um, this is actually uh, showing uh, survival by diagnosis. You know, do some indications do better than others? And this may be relevant when you have, um, you know, um, patients. So, so uh, for CF, actually, survival is much better. It's 9.3 years. Uh, whereas if you're retransplanting a patient, probably the worst at a median of 2.9 years. Now, uh, look over here. Uh, survival for COPD versus pulmonary fibrosis for uh, idiopathic pneumonia for, for COPD is 5.8 years, for idiopathic pneumonia is 4.9 years. So almost a year difference, and that difference is actually significant. So definitely the indication affects the outcome of lung transplantation. Now, why are they dying? And uh, the affects the ICU because many of them die in the ICU. Well, uh, it depends on where you are. This vertical dotted line here is one year, and you can see that very early, between zero and 30 days, the main cause of death is gonna be graft failure. Uh, but shortly afterwards, during the first year, it's gonna be infection. And, and beyond the first year, it's gonna be bronchiolitis obliteral syndrome, which is probably a type of chronic rejection but infection remains the second cause of death. It, this is important uh, because if you have a patient in your ICU who may be infected and has had a lung transplant, this patient requires very, very aggressive workup to try to identify the source of infection. They need a bronchoscopy, they may need a colonoscopy to have diarrhea, and they need very aggressive treatment. We can never be complacent with patients because, again, infection is one of the major killers uh, in these patients. Uh, now, this usually leads to a question, well, um, what do I do in my unit if I have a patient with an infection which kills these people? What do I do with the immune suppression? Uh, well, uh, this shows the most commonly used immune suppression. Here, uh, you have the uh, um, calcineurin inhibitors, usually tacrolimus, and here you have the um, uh, antiproliferative agents, usually mycophenolate. Uh, and I won't talk much about sterilimus. So of these two, uh, we usually uh, consider tacrolimus the most important. Uh, and if a patient is actively infected, we continue the tacrolimus, uh, but we may actually decrease or hold the mycophenolate. Uh, so if you don't have input from a transplant person, uh, a quick thing is you may hold or, you know, again, or discontinue the mycophenolate in the unit if you think your patient has an acute infection, but always keep the tacrolimus. That's important because tacrolimus has other side effects. For example, these are morbidity in survivors, uh, and you can see that within five years, essentially 53% of the patients have renal dysfunction usually from the calcineurin inhibitors. Uh, earlier on, it's actually 22%. And uh, remember that you can survive without kidneys, but not without lungs. So if your patient is coming with acute renal failure and uh, is on tacrolimus, continue the tacrolimus unless, uh, within range, unless a transplant uh, physician suggests otherwise, like switching to sarolimus. Now look that after uh, 10 years, uh, the number of patients with renal dysfunction is essentially 72 percent. Uh, so that's uh, very common. Uh, now, who is most likely to have a bad outcome? Uh, well, uh, the outcome depends a lot on age, and you can see here that beyond 60, above, if the recipient is above 60, their cumulative mortality goes up, and above 70, it's even higher. Most patients most centers, because of this, will not transplant patients above 60. Uh, we actually do until 70. Uh, some do higher than that. Uh, the uh, age of the recipient is highly associated with uh, outcome. And I won't go into all the other causes associated with outcome, uh, but this may be relevant if you have a patient in the unit and you're thinking, should this patient be a candidate for a lung transplant? Now, interestingly, the age of the donor is a lot less associated with outcome. Uh, so if you have an elderly patient up to 60 years old who could be a donor, uh, they certainly uh, are in that range and uh, you should consider evaluating their for lung transplant donation as well as other organs. Uh, now that's all I'm going to say about um, risks. 
Uh, but is it worthwhile to do this very expensive procedure? Uh, well, uh, this actually shows the functional status of the surviving recipients. And the third column here is at three years. And you can see that the vast majority of patients, uh, uh, almost 70%, uh, these are Karnofsky scales, have actually a very good uh, functional status after three years. Uh, and um, uh, I used to be very uh, nihilistic about this before I knew about lung transplant. These patients actually can do very well. Uh, most of them fortunately do. Uh, so uh, at this point, I am going to uh, summarize uh, uh, this uh, this brief talk by saying that the number of lung transplants is definitely increasing on a yearly basis, and most patients are going to receive bilateral lung transplants. Um, the main indications are going to be idiopathic interstitial pneumonias, mostly IPF, also COPD and CF, cystic fibrosis. Uh, now, the median survival for a bilateral lung transplant is 7.4 years, and it depends on indications. Survival is better for cystic fibrosis and worse for retransplantation. And the main causes of death are going to be for the first 30 days prep failure, uh, 30 days to a year infection, and greater than one year bronchiolitis obliterance or bronchiolitis obliterance syndrome. Finally, most patients are immunosuppressed with tacrolimus, mycophenolate, and prednisone. Uh, most patients get chronic kidney disease, but overall, the functional status is very good at three years. Uh, and with that, I leave you with a picture of my city, and uh, I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much, Gustavo. And uh, this was a very clear and very very informative presentation. Uh, I think that we, we have time for one or two questions. Uh, the first one would be uh, from a critical care perspective. So we receive sometimes patients uh, who may be with, with an acute respiratory failure and have a chronic lung disease for which no real uh, evaluation could be made because of uh, maybe no follow-up or lack of follow-up. Uh, and some patients may be considered as a potential recipients for lung transplant. So they are getting critical care support with the only hope that they would receive a transplant at any day. This can be perceived by many of us like a fantasy. So I would like to know from your great experience whether you think that if we receive an IPF patient or a patient who has a chronic interstitial lung disease from unidentified uh, etiology, do you think that this patient could receive advanced lung support for, with the potential hope that he or she will get uh, a lung transplant? Well, yes, with caveats. Uh, so first, of course, the patient has to meet all the other criteria for uh, lung transplantation, meaning they don't have any other major comorbidity um, and have, uh, you know, uh, um, caregivers and all that. But once we get past that point, say somebody who has only IPF and is in the hospital with an acute IPF exacerbation, uh, then uh, uh, the main issue is deconditioning. So the key enemy is, I mean, assuming the patient is not acutely infected, uh, the key enemy is going to be, uh, you know, is this patient going to be strong enough to support the surgery? Uh, so patients, as you know, once they are in the ICU, they very rapidly get very deconditioned, uh, and that's the major threat. So it highly depends on what can you do. So, for example, if the patient gets intubated, uh, that is not necessarily a, an acute a form of contraindication for transplant, with the understanding that every day that passes, that patient is going to be weaker. Usually after three or four days on mechanical ventilation, uh, that patient is very unlikely uh, to tolerate a transplant, even if they are uh, not infected. And the main reason, again, is going to be the conditioning, but that can vary with the individual patient and, and assuming they have a full rehab support and at getting appropriate um, you know, rehabilitation. Now, if the patient is actually on ECMO uh, and therefore, uh, you know, maybe can be less the condition because it can move more, then that means that certainly there's a longer bridge for transplant. Uh, but again, the key issue is um, 
uh, not necessarily that they're in acute respiratory failure, uh, but that they don't have any other major organ involvement and they are strong enough uh, to be able to tolerate the, the surgery. And of course, they haven't got an infection because in that case, they cannot be transplanted. Thank you very much. The other thing that was very interesting from your slide set is the very heavy immunosuppression that the, you are providing to your patients uh, with the three drugs, including the steroids. Uh, so what's your uh, routine and prophylaxis strategy for these patients uh, against pneumocystis, against fungals, and maybe against uh, CMV and HSV? Well, that highly depends on uh, a number of factors. Um, for example, for pneumocystis, um, all of these patients should be on prophylaxis, uh, usually with uh, trimetroprim sulfa, uh, but if not with atrovaquone or dapsone or something, but they have to be on prophylaxis. Uh, then uh, we, all, we have them all on uh, some prophylaxis for thrush, you know, clotrimazole troches or something. Now, when it comes to CMB, that depends highly on what's the status, CMB status of the donor and the recipient, you know, plus, 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 minus, or minus, minus. And depending on that, we can either give uh, prophylaxis for a short period of time, uh, for a longer amount of time, or on a permanent basis. Most, most cases, it may be for a number of months, depending, again, on the status of the donor and the recipient. Most patients do not need CMB prophylaxis forever. Uh, uh, that's only temporary, unless, except a subset of patients. Uh, for fungus, uh, we normally do not prophylax against um, fungal diseases other than the mouth, um, you know, than the troches. Um, some patients may come from endemic areas where there might be certain endemic fungi, for example, um, you know, coxy, and that's a different story. For the vast majority of patients, do not need that type of prophylaxis. So to summarize, the, the one that everybody has to be forever is um, PCP prophylaxis uh, and crush, and the other ones, the other types of prophylaxis depend a lot on, on, the, on the patient, uh, him or herself. Thank you very much, uh, Gustavo, for this great presentation. Uh, it's now time to move to the next presentation uh, from uh, Argentina with uh, Professor Gustavo Lopardo, who is the official representative of the Pan American Association of Infectious Disease uh, and who is going to lecture on the respiratory complications in HIV patients uh, who are admitted to the ICU. Thank you very much, uh, Gustavo. It's okay. Great. Let's go on. Perfect. Excuse me, sorry, in America we always have problems, and I want to <laughs> listen to you. There is good no problem now, please and, go on. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, good afternoon and good evening, depending on the place of the world you are, and I want to thank you for this invitation. And I will start my presentation sharing with you a, a couple of pictures from my city. You know that Buenos Aires is a city with a very eclectic architecture, and also a very eclectic culture going from the, the opera house to the football stadium. I have no disclosures regarding this presentation. And, and I will talk about the, the respiratory complications in patients with HIV and AIDS, particularly those admitted to intensive care unit. And, and I want to start with you sharing, which is the, the current epidemiological, epidemiological situation and according to the United Nations, about 37 million people over the world are showing the, the new cases per year. And you can see that by the end of the 20th century, it reached a peak. After that, it slowly uh, began to decrease. And that decrease exactly was coincident with the increasing number of people, be, people being treated. And this is what we understand as treatment, as prevention, definitely the treatment of HIV infection prevents new infections. As I know, most of the attendees today, yeah, and here this graph shows countries who have a lower number of new HIV infection during the past years, so Salvador, Colombia, and Nicaragua, they are in a good situation. But most countries, including Argentina, and particularly Chile, are increasing. 
number of new problem for all of us. Now, to which is the the perspective nowadays of which is the main reason or cause of death in people with HIV and AIDS all over the world? And I choose this that is a very representative for the Swiss study. You know, Swiss is a very small country, and they were able to follow this cohort of patients for a long period of time. And you can see here that during the 80s and early 90s, the main cause of death in this pink, or I don't know what color is this, was some reason related to AIDS. In 1986, we started to use antiretroviral therapy, and you can see that is here, the percentage. And if we move to the fourth bar, meaning this was 10 years ago, 2007, in Swiss, there was no death related to AIDS defining conditions, and the most frequent reason of this were heart disease, malignancies, very similar to general population. Of course, not the, all the people, all the attendees who are participating in this conference think that this is their, what happened in their hospital in their everyday life, and we will, I will share with you some other experiences from our region. This is a typical table showing which are the most common respiratory complications in people living with HIV according to the CDS4 cell count. And that has not changed in the last 20 or 25 years. And bronchitis and community acquired pneumonia due to streptococcus pneumonia or homophilus, pulmonary tuberculosis, and several malignancies are typical of any CD4 cell count. And when the CD4 cell count decreases, we started to see pneumocystis herovesi, bacterial pneumonia, the tuberculosis switch from pulmonary to disseminative. And when the CD4 cell count is even lower, below 100 or 50, new fungal infections, CMV, or even Mycobacterium avium complex will, will, will be there and will be a, a, a reason of respiratory complication. However, currently, in the era of antiretroviral therapy, things are changing, and we can see that several compli respiratory complications have a, a very de diminished incidence, such as pulmonary kaposis, CMV, or mycobacterium avium complex. Some other have has already diminished, but not as much as tuberculosis. Definitely, tuberculosis is the first AIDS-defining AIDS condition related to death today all over the world. <coughs> also PCP and lymphoma. However, some other respiratory complications are stable or even increasing, and these are lung cancer, COPD, and pulmonary hypertension, and these are not infectious complications, of course. The start is probably the most relevant clinical trial ever performed in the arena of HIV, and the, the, the objective, the main objective of STAR was to answer a critical question. If patients with a high CD4 cell count above 500 had any benefit starting early antiretroviral therapy or defer, and as you can see, the endpoints were clinical endpoints. Start was definitely an international effort with about 4,700 4, patients participating, 35 countries. We participated in the study, and, and as you can see, 25% of patients were enrolled in Latin America. And of course, it was shown that there was a clear benefit starting immediately compared to the first therapy. But what I want to remark you is that even in this population with a high CD4 cell count, they were at risk of developing pulmonary complications such as tuberculosis, lymphoma, Kaposi, or even pneumocystis herovacin pneumonia. And this is a, a study recently published early this year by the Instituto Emilio Rivas in Sao Paulo, Brazil. And in the last period, they, they, they performed a thorough microbiological uh, investigation in more, more than 200 patients who were hospitalized due to pulmonary infections. But you can see that most of them were naive of antiretroviral therapy or had a low CD4 cell count below 200. And as you can see, the, main, the first diagnosis was pneumocystis herovesi. The second one was tuberculosis. And the third one was streptococcus pneumonia. So even 
in the era of highly active antiretroviral therapy, when patients are naive or had biological failure, we still see the typical ACE-defining conditions. But now we are moving to the non-infectious complications, particularly lung cancer that has a, a high incidence, probably three or four times higher compared to the general population, is definitely today the most frequent non ace defining malignancy. And we know that there are several factors associated with lung cancer, such, such as length of HIV infection, probably is higher the risk in patients with lower CD4 cell count, but it's not completely clear. Usually these patients have lung cancer in an early age and, and they, are, they come with a late presentation. And even after adjusting for confounding factors such as smoking and age, HIV infection is still a risk factor for, for lung cancer. COPD is also very common. You know that people living with HIV, they're heavily smoker, and, and, but probably the immune pulmonary dysfunction that have patients with HIV infections and the changes in the microbiota could be associated to the higher risk of COPD in this population. And finally, this unusual disease for us, we are specialists in infectious diseases, the pulmonary hypertension, which seems to be maybe one thousand times higher compared to the general population. The reason is not very clear, probably the chronic inflammation associated with HIV infection. When we see a, a chest X-ray as this, we, we all think of us pneumocystis herovaceae, of course, also one like this. And when we see this picture, we don't know, but when you perform a bronchoscopy, we can think that probably this is pulmonary kaposi. And in this table, we can see that several chest X-ray findings are typical of several etiologies, and we were a patient, a patient developed pneumothorax, of course, we think about pneumocystis herovesi. When patients have a pleural effusion, we think about Kaposi, tuberculosis, or pyogenic bacteria. And when patients present with diffuse interstitial infiltrate, of course, pneumocystis herovesi will be the, the first cause. But in many cases, chest X-ray is not conclusive, and in those cases, higher resolution computer tomography will be really, really a valuable meth diagnosis method. These are uh, results of the study I showed you before of Instituto Emilio Rivas in Sao Paulo, Brazil. And in, the, in those 200 patients, they performed a thorough microbiological investigation, and they had a theological diagnosis in more than 75% of patients, eh, using blood cultures, sputum, PCR, antigen, and in many patients, even branco alveolar lavage. And what I want to remark is when we are dealing <coughs> with these patients who are severely immunocompromised, the etiological diagnosis is really, is really very, very relevant for all, all of us. As we have a very short presentation, I want to share with you a, a few practical points. And, and when patients present with respiratory failure, particularly those who are admitted to the intensive care unit, in 80% of cases, the reason will be infectious, pneumonia by, caused by trisprocotin pneumonia, pneumocystis herovese, or TB. When patients present with progressive dyspnea, that's typical of PC, PCP, when it's rapidly, rapidly progressing, we must think about streptococcus pneumonia. When patients suffer hemoptysis, of course, tuberculosis and lung cancer. And in patients with fever and sweat, those symptoms are suggestive, of fungal infections, mycobacteria, lymphoma. And in those patients with unexplained dyspnea, we should think about pulmonary hypertension. Smoker, they are higher risk of lung cancer. Intravenous drug user, they are particularly at risk of tuberculosis, also bacterial infection, and they have, are at higher risk of pulmonary hypertension. And today, in our everyday practice, we see very often patients with undetectable viral load and a very high CD4 and count, and then always we think about non-infectious complications. However, in this quite recent publication, you can see that when patients with HIV or AIDS are admitted to intensive care unit, 
but Adolf failure today is still one of the most frequent reasons for admission to intensive care unit. This is a typical algorithm that, that was developed probably 25 years ago and has not changed. And we all know that when patients present with high CD4 cell count, we may think about trochlear bronchitis, community acquired pneumonia, and of course, when, when we are approaching patients with low CD4 cell count, the first pathogen will be pneumocystis gyrobesi. But we, of course, we can think about tuberculosis, about fungal infections, about C, even CMV, and that will depend on the epidemiology of the region, the CD4 cell count of the patient, several clinical findings, the prof primary prophylaxis patient was receiving. And when we see a chest x-ray like this, of course, we are very worried. And this was a patient who was admitted last year to my hospital. He was diagnosed with HIV infection, uh, uh, cervical lymphadenopathy, was biops, and the final diagnosis was tuberculosis. He started therapy with four drugs for tuberculosis. And several weeks later, he started antiretroviral therapy. And he developed this severe pulmonary compromise we were thinking about resistant tuberculosis. We were thinking about another co-infection, particularly with a fungal infection, and everything was negative. And the final diagnosis was immune reconstitution inflammatory syndrome. That's a typical paradoxical response. When patients start with a very, very low CD4 cell count, we start antiretroviral therapy, and the immune response starts to develop, and patients develop this kind of symptoms. Sometimes they even require a serial therapy. We should always bear in mind that we may offer to this population PCV13 and polysaccharide vaccine in order to prevent infections due to streptococcus pneumonia. And for those patients who are naive for a pneumococcal vaccine, this sequential first PCV, because it's a conjugate vaccine, and at least five, eight weeks later, PPV. 23, and we may, may give a second dose five years later. And of course, always remember flu vaccine every year. This will be my two last slide, and I, I will take the opportunity to share what, with all of you because this week is the World Antibiotic Awareness Week. Okay? We are all really very, wor very uh, worried because antibiotic resistance today is a threat to the public health, uh, and this is the word to raise awareness to the general community and particularly to the medical community to, to really make a very prudent use of antibiotics. Always wash your hands in your hospital. So having said that, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Lopardo. I think that uh, this was a really wonderful uh, overview of uh, the issue of uh, uh, critically ill patients infected with HIV. And uh, I want to tell you whether you could summarize the most recent developments in the diagnostic strategy in these patients. For instance, um, do you sample them when they come to the ICU or do you treat them based on your algorithm? Okay. Usually that depends on which is the CD4 cell count of patients. In those patients with a high CD4 cell count, in general, we think that the probability will be streptococcus pneumonia, hemophilus, and it's not necessarily to sample the patient in 100% of cases. Of course, we take blood cultures. If Binax now antigen is available, of course, we will use it. We know that the risk of invasive disease is about 70 times higher compared to the general population. However, when the CD4 cell count is lower, particularly in patients who, who has recently been diagnosed with HIV infections, as you know, pneumocystis carini will be probably the first diagnosis, but they are at risk of fungal infections, tuberculosis infections, very unusual, but maybe even the cytomegalovirus. And everything will depend on the region where you live. If you live in Arkansas, histoplasma will be at high risk in other areas of the world will be cryptococcus. So in those patients, we prefer to perform a thorough microbiological investigation that was done in Instituto Emilio Rivas in San Pablo uh, and to treat patients according to the diagnosis. It's almost impossible to start a patient with 
trimetropine sulfur sulfamidoxazole plus steroids plus abetalactam asian plus amacrolide plus amphotericin plus four drugs for tuberculosis. Thank you very Sometimes much. Sometimes we see it very often in intensive care unit. Thank you. I don't know if our uh, uh, next uh, uh, chairs for the question and answers are uh, currently present. Uh, Mario, Fabio, and Orville. And any of those patients uh, in our program. Um, well, it used to be a formal contraindication, uh, uh, not necessarily so anymore. That highly depends on the on the on the center. You know, we uh, we uh, we we haven't had the the referral, you know, of that type of patient to us. Um, but um, the short answer to you is that we actually uh, haven't done it. Yeah. Uh, uh, yes, uh, I have a question here. I'm, I'm Orville again. Sorry, I uh, lost the connection before. Um, but if um, if you may, um, it's not for the opponent, which was very nice um, talks about um, these very exciting topics. But I would like to add, ask the question to Dr. Asulai um, about cancer admitting patient to the um, cancer patient to the ICU. Um, the perspective from the intensivists is very different from the perspective in uh, from the oncologists, um, and usually with these new drugs and new treatment and very high um, specific treatment for cancer, uh, and how bad um, uh, perform the usual um, uh, tools um, to predict the mortality or outcome in these patients. Is it better to work in a better um, prediction tool or um, training intensivists in these new drugs is the best way? What do you think? Well, this is a, this is a very good question. And as you know, it has been raised in a paper published in Journal of Clinical Oncology a year ago from with the team from uh, Marcio Suarez and George Salu from Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. And they have used their data to show very nicely that uh, the way patients are cared by in the ICU and the relationship between uh, critical care physicians and hemato-oncologists uh, was making the outcomes different. Uh, for instance, uh, when the hemato or the onco was able to round and to come every day to the ICU and, uh, and uh, discuss the patient situation with the ICU people, there was a reduction of mortality with a nose ratio that was very, very significant. So my, my point is quite clear. I think that we need to work together with hemato and oncologists. Uh, and this is actually very, very easy because the number of patients uh, with uh, cancers who are going to reach the ICU in the next decade is going to increase exponentially, not because we are going to save all of them. I'm not sure about that, but only because they are into therapeutic programs that includes immunotherapy. And as you know, when you are using high dose nivolumab or other uh, PD-1 and PDL one or anti-CTLA-4 uh, blockers, you are actually creating about 20% of toxicity and not far than half these patients with toxicity need some kind of ICU support. The other thing is that, that we are now trafficking the T cells of uh, patients with cancer by bringing them their own T cells uh, uh, to control the disease. This is called CAR T cells and this new therapy exposed the patients to a very high risk um, of cytokine releasing syndrome. So it, it is considered that about 20% of these patients are going to reach the ICU. And just to give you a small perspective on patients with ALLB or uh, uh, young patients with ALLB, and this is now uh, uh, started in myeloma, in lymphoma, and even in melanoma. So these patients are going to reach our ICUs. If I had only very a short comment to summarize, I would say that uh, palliative care doesn't mean that patients don't have to come to the ICU. I think that every patient needs to receive a certain amount of palliative care, and it can be associated with a very high level of critical care. 
So the question is always to find the right balance be, be in the selection of these patients. Thank you. So maybe now I can turn to a question on the use of non-invasive ventilation strategies that Prof. Ferrer very nicely pointed out in immunocompromised patients, but this time not in cancer patients, but in lung transplant, <coughs> sorry, or HIV patients. So maybe anyone of you can answer? Yeah, <clears throat> we have no experience in lung cancer patients because my center, uh, we, can, we don't have a lung transplant uh, program. In patients with uh, HIV, yes, we have uh, used, but uh, more frequently in the past, uh, before the, the era of the, of the highly active antiretroviral therapy. During the last uh, five or ten uh, years, I should say that we have seen a, a very few uh, patients with HIV infections in the SCU because actually they have a very good clinical control and the incidence of severe respiratory complications is really lower. I don't know if you have also the same experience in your centers. I must say that uh, for, for patients with cancer, we are very rarely using uh, non-invasive ventilation for hypoxemia, but it is increasingly used in patients uh, who are HIV recipients uh, at many spaces. I don't know whether there is a strong rationale to offer an IV to patients who are HIV more than patients who are lung transplant recipients, kidney transplant recipients, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. One thing that is clear for us is that uh, when we are looking at outcomes, they are changing so much that uh, I understand and I think it's uh, reasonable to make a trial of high flow oxygen an non-invasive strategy, and we should select those patients who are going to reduce their respiratory rate, improve oxygenation, and, and the most important thing, and their status, that respiratory status, must uh, enable us uh, to perform a, an appropriate diagnostic strategy rather than going blind without knowing what is ongoing in the lungs. I think that this is a major point. Yes, yeah, sure, uh, sure. The, the uh, correct diagnosis is is a good point. Uh, what we have uh, improved uh, during the last years is the performance of uh, fiber optic from Cospegi with uh, the aid of uh, non-invasive ventilation. We have a really a very good experience. Even patients with uh, important uh, respiratory distress, but who not distress, I mean uh, dif uh, uh, respiratory difficulty, dyspnea, but who are not in need for immediate intubation. Our experience in uh, performing bronchoscopy uh, through the uh, face mask with non invasive ventilation is very good. We uh, have a very uh, low uh, rate of complications, particularly the need for immediate intubation after the, 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 the examination. And in general, mm, in these patients, uh, we have increased the rate of performing uh, BAL without the need of intubate them. At the end, you have to individualize and uh, take individual decisions, They're sure depending do. on whether a patient is responding well or, uh, or bad to non-invasive ventilation, and uh, as commented before, depending on the number of uh, other organ system failures uh, in addition to, to respiratory failure. Yeah, I think that um, when it comes to lung transplant, uh, I think it's similar to everybody said with one major difference. Uh, which is, uh, let's say, during the what I would call the subacute immediate post-transplant period. Uh, so immediately after the transplant, and the, and the real question is, what is the status of the anastomosis? So in the immediate post period, you know, that's, that's less of an issue. It's a fresh anastomosis. A little bit afterwards, there usually is uh, not the best perfusion towards any anastomosis. It's just the way it is. Uh, you know, sometimes there is dehiscence, uh, an infection may weaken the anastomosis, and that may raise concerns about whether we actually want to have any kind of positive pressure, invasive or non-invasive, yeah. in, in this patient, you know. So for that reason, uh, you know, things that do not require necessarily increasing the 
pressure dramatically in the airways are favored. You know, for example, high flow oxygen uh, would be the, the preferred option, you know. Uh, and uh, that's especially true if the patient happens to develop a dehiscence, uh, or in which case um, we definitely try to avoid any kind of positive pressure uh, in the lungs. Uh, beyond that phase, I think uh, there's no real difference compared to the other populations that are immunosuppressed that we have uh, actually discussed. Completely agree with you. Uh, surely in the next following years, high flow oxygen therapy in all this uh, um, group of patients with non hyperkamic respiratory failure will be clearly the, the first option. Uh, we, we try non-invasive uh, respiratory support, by sure. And uh, I think we have uh, two, three minutes or really. Do, we, do you have a question or I can follow up? Yes, you can follow up. So this is a question, another question for uh, Professor Ferrer. I was very interested by the helmet study that you just shown and that comes after, you know, more than a decade from data from mostly Italy showing that it's feasible, it's safe, it's effective. But the treatment and the strategy was not actually used uh, over the last decade until the trial published last year. So is it something that you are considering to use for immunocompromised patients or overall patients with hypoxemia? And do you think that one of the strengths that it brings could be that it provides a continuous strategy with a high, a, a very long exposure to positive pressure? Yes, uh, we have no experience with the helmet. We tried this uh, in, during a short period of time to assess the, the feasibility of using this. Actually, uh, what is clearly, and if we trust in the, all the Italian studies and also in this recent trial, is that for hypoxemic patients, uh, it seems a, a better uh, support. The, the physiological studies uh, go in this direction. The uh, tolerance uh, in these studies is clearly better for uh, helmet, but there is a reluctance to extend its use outside Italy, and this is a very curious uh, issue because uh, in Italy is really uh, very uh, popular. I think that there is a, a resistance because you need a quite different uh, management of the of the ventilator. We have to manage this with uh, very different settings. Uh, maybe you have to use. Uh, tighter volumes as double as those you will use with standard uh, mask or uh, with intubated patients. And uh, I think it generates resist resistance in physicians. And now with the rise and the, the, the demonstration of the efficacy of high flow oxygen therapy, uh, probably it will not help to extend the use of the helmet. So um, if uh, I'm not sure what is the future. Maybe with this trial, it can extend its use, but um, probably the, the best option would, could be a comparison between a helmet and high flow oxygen therapy. Maybe it will be the, the final uh, um, answer to what is the best non-invasive uh, technique to support these patients. Yeah, I, I really believe that it makes sense. And if it's in immunocompromised patients, I would add a, group, a third group with patients receiving only standard oxygen compared to NIV or helmet. Mm -hmm. So I think that we are on time and I must congratulate the organizer for making uh, this uh, wonderful critical care lung. And this World Day is for sure a success and we were really delighted to be part of it. Thank you. And this is back to you and uh, have a really uh, great follow up. And thank you thank to you. the great, uh, great lecture bye bye, that we thank had. You. Thank you, all of you. Thank you so thank much. You. Bye bye.